2016 Libertarian presidential candidate, Daryl W. Perry. The speech that I'm giving this morning is titled A Rebel's Journey. And it's one of the things that, as a radio show host, I like asking my guests, how did you come to the ideas of liberty? And this is sort of my journey of how I went from being a Christian conservative to someone that believes that all forms of coercive government should be abolished. And the journey for me actually began when I was in high school. I took a public speaking class because I thought it would be fun. And there was a speech given by another student called Just Say No Is Not Possible. And at the time, I thought, you know, drugs are bad, okay, because that's what I was taught in school. And this guy gave his speech about why Nancy Reagan's Just Say No Isn't Possible. And it really got me to begin thinking about drug policy in general. And a few other things happened here and there. And I was speaking with one of the deacons at the church that I attended. And he said, you know, Daryl, we need to get back to traditional American values. Well, what are traditional American values? And he had no answer for me. Just, we need to get back to them. So I started doing research, trying to figure out what are traditional American values. And it wasn't maybe a couple of months later, I saw a documentary, might have been from the History Channel, it could have been Discovery, but it was the untold history of drugs in America. And that was the first time that I found out that before the FDA was created, you could purchase cannabis, heroin, and pretty much any other substance that you wanted from the Sears catalog. <laughs> I was never told that in school. How great would it be to be able to go to Walgreens to purchase cannabis that you could then use either for therapeutic purposes to heal your arthritis or for recreational purposes the way you enjoy a cigarette. Because after all, remember, Walgreens still sells cigarettes. <laughs> so it was really the drug war that began me down the path towards the ideas of liberty. And it wasn't because of reading philosophy books written by Murray Rothbard or Ayn Rand or any of the great libertarian philosophers that continued me down the path of liberty. It was studying history and realizing that throughout human history, for the most part, and there are exceptions to this, obviously, but for the most part, it has always been legal to do things that do not cause a victim, meaning purchasing cannabis from Sears. It was generally throughout human history until the late 1800s, it was legal to marry whomever you wanted to without government interference. And learning the reasons behind the marriage license requirements is rather interesting and also racist, as are many of the laws that we have in this country. The drug war was started because of racism. I'm sure most of you know this, that it was the you know, propaganda of the Mexicans coming across with their marijuana. Well, marijuana was not the term that Americans knew for cannabis. They knew it as cannabis. They purchased it from Sears. So it was government propaganda changing the name of what they knew. There were also you know, reasons for making cocaine illegal. And a lot of that had to do with you know, demonizing minorities. Same thing with the marriage license requirement. In the reconstructed South, sadly, 
there were laws and requirements saying that a white person could not marry a black person. The only way that we can make sure this doesn't happen is if we make them come get a license to then get married. So you take something that you were allowed to do, you then regulate it, and then you can decide who and how and when. Some of the other sort of issues that helped me along the path, one I would say is immigration. And immigration is still a very touchy subject. And I, I understand that not all libertarians are completely open border libertarians. But it was a trip to Ellis Island that really sort of opened my eyes to the unjust, I, I, I guess, unjustness of American immigration policy. Because in Ellis Island, and even before that, if one wanted to immigrate to the United States, they showed up. That's how my 13th great-grandfather arrived in Jamestown. He showed up. You know, Pocahontas wasn't there asking for papers, please. That's just not how it happened. And, you know, the immigration policy, I believe it was in the late 1800s when there was the policy restricting how many people could immigrate to the U.S. from China. And then there was the scare of Irish, and then the scare of Italians, and now it's the Mexicans. And it is just very interesting if you look back through history, the xenophobia that surrounds immigration policy. Because as long as they, quote, look like us and talk like us, then there hasn't seemed to be a problem. But it's when people sort of look different and act different that the you know, people that call themselves conservatives get all up in arms. And if I would have heard somebody 15 years ago talking about, you know, we just need to open the borders and let everybody in, I probably would have been scared. Not because, you know, like, we're going to be overrun, but I didn't understand that that's how the policy used to be. I remember it was in 2000 when Elian Gonzalez arrived in Miami and there was the big public debate about whether this little Cuban boy should be allowed to stay in the United States or whether he should be returned forcibly to Cuba. And I forget which side that Rush Limbaugh took. He took the let the boy stay. And that seemed rather odd because, you know, Rush Limbaugh is generally not pro-immigration. But he did so only because he didn't want to be seen as agreeing with Bill Clinton. Because Bill Clinton's position was we need to return the boy to Cuba. And throughout the whole debate, I kept asking people, what does the law say? What does the law say? And nobody could tell me. Well, I now know what the law says, and the law for people immigrating from Cuba is different than the law for people immigrating from any of the other 192 UN recognized countries in the world. The immigration law for Cuba, and I think this should be the law for every country around the world, is what they call the wet foot, dry foot policy, meaning that if you're on dry land, you have dry feet, you get to stay. If the Coast Guard finds you in the middle of the ocean, they turn you around. Well, I don't like that part of the rule, but you know, if we're going to obey the Constitution, and I tend to agree with Lysander Spooner that the Constitution has either authorized the tyranny that we have or has been powerless to prevent it, in either case it's unfit to exist, but since it does exist, and it's the law that all members of Congress have sworn to uphold, if we're going to abide by that document, that document says that there's to be a uniform, uh, a uniform policy for naturalization. Well, by having 192 different sets of immigration policies, 
that doesn't seem very uniform to me. That seems very sporadic and random. And within the subset of the 192 different policies, there are other policies. If you're a scientist, front of the line. If you're an athlete and you can win us a gold medal at the Olympics, you get even more in front of the line. And if you're from a country that our military has been bombing for the last however many years, you go to the front of the line as well. But everybody else, back of the line, it costs thousands upon thousands of dollars, and it takes years. I worked for an airline for four years, left there about four years ago, just before the porno scanners arrived, and one of my coworkers was from Malawi. It took him nine years to go through the citizenship process. He had spent $15,000 on paperwork and lawyers, and he still had not completed the citizenship process. How is this fair and just? You know, we call ourselves the land of the free, but you're not free. There's the book, Three Felonies a Day, and the claim is that each of us commit three felonies every day unknowingly. And I know that there are some days where I've committed at least seven. <laughs> if, if you guys come to Pork Fest this summer, then you can commit at least like 10 before breakfast. <laughs> because some of the laws are just so strange and ludicrous. There's a law that says that it is illegal for me to make a straw purchase of alcohol for anyone, not just someone under the age of 21. I've got a friend who, under New Hampshire law, is not allowed to go to the liquor store because he was given this no trespass order saying, you are not allowed on any of our facilities. Which means that if he wants liquor, he must violate the law to get it. He must either pay someone to purchase liquor for him, or he must distill his own. Both of those are illegal. But it's one of those things that just continues and continues. And if you look at the way governments function, Sooner or later, everything will be illegal because that's what governments do. The only way, and you know, there might be other ways to do it, but the only way, in my opinion, that we can get to the point of not all being unconvicted felons is to first get rid of the federal government because the federal government has done nothing in its 200 and some odd years of existence other than trample on individual rights. When the federal government was first created, there was already a national debt at that time, which that's something else they don't teach you in schools. But there were, I think, only three federal <coughs> crimes. There's now more crimes at the federal level than what one could read in a lifetime. You add on the state and municipal <coughs> violations, and I've heard that it's more laws than could be read in four lifetimes. How exactly are we supposed to be free when we have more laws than anyone could ever read in their life? How are we supposed to be free when we have people who are elected supposedly to represent us who pass bills that they don't read. The USA Patriot Act, and I wish that I would have written down what the acronym stood for, but it's something, something protecting us against terrorists. But there are so many things in that bill that have basically made each and every one of us possible criminals just for existing and thinking that the government isn't the great and wonderful entity that the government claims to be. I've heard stories from Judge Napolitano of librarians who were served with some of these secret warrants 
from you know FBI in accordance with the USA Patriot Act. And the one librarian, not knowing what this document was that she was handed, turned to another librarian and said, what is this? And was arrested on the spot for violating one of the provisions of the warrant that says that you were not to mention the warrant to another person. <laughs> Meaning that when she went to trial, she could not speak with her lawyer about the warrant because she would have then been in violation again. The man who supposedly wrote the USA Patriot Act, Jim Sensenbrenner, has since come out and said that if we had known what Section 215 was claimed to have authorized, and Section 215, by the way, is the section that the NSA cites on being able to look at everything that you see on the internet and listen to your phone calls, even though they claim they don't listen to the phone calls, we just collect the metadata, which actually gives them more information than if they were listening to the telephone calls because it tells what time the phone call was made, to whom the phone call was made, and the duration of the phone call. There was a college professor, I forget where, but somewhere out in California, where he somehow got his hands on some of this telephone metadata, with people's permission, of course, and was able to determine that one girl was pregnant, because of the telephone calls that she made to a doctor and the time that the calls were made. One of the calls was made to Planned Parenthood and several calls were made to her sister. Someone else was determined to have been cheating on their spouse because of the time and duration and something of the telephone calls. So if a college professor with very little training in diagnosing metadata is able to make these sort of determinations about people's behavior, what is the NSA doing? Because they have all day to sit there and look at the metadata without our permissions. And according to some information leaked by Edward Snowden, just the DC facility committed eight violations per day. The actual number was 3,756 in a 12 month period. And I broke it down, assuming that they work all seven days of the week, every day of the year, that's eight violations per day. But one of the lawyers for the ACLU, he was even more shocked than I was and said, it's amazing that they can violate their own policies at all when you look at how broad the policies are that allow them to do everything they do. But Jim Sensenbrenner, the guy that supposedly wrote the Patriot Act, that authorized this stuff, said that had we known that the NSA would claim that Section 215 gives them authorization to do this, we never would have passed it. I would love to believe that a politician were telling you the truth, but I just can't believe it. Because I'm not convinced that Jim Sensenbrenner even wrote the Patriot Act. I'm not convinced that any member of Congress even looked at the Patriot Act before it was passed. Because if you go back and look at the history of the bill, it was introduced on, I believe it was October 23rd, 2001. Passed the House the next day, passed the Senate the day after that, and then was signed by President Bush the day after it passed the Senate. There's no way that any member of Congress was able to read this or voting on it. But they do this all the time. The Affordable Care Act was, I, I forget exactly how many pages, I've seen figures of you know, 1,300 to 1,900 pages. And even if they would have read this bill, there's no way for them to have known what the bill was actually going to do. Nancy Pelosi is famously quoted as saying, we have to pass the bill to find out what is in it. She wasn't lying, nor was she joking. 
because numerous sections of the Affordable Care Act say something, something, something as directed by the supervisor, meaning that whoever's in charge of health and human services gets to write this policy. Again, I ask the question, how can we claim to be a free country when the government that is supposedly there to represent us isn't even writing the bills that they then use against us with the force of law? They're writing something that says that the Director of Health and Human Services gets to determine what sort of insurance plan you must purchase. Well, I've not had insurance since 2010, and that's on purpose. Because as soon as the mandate passed, saying you must purchase health insurance, I canceled my plan as soon as I could. Because I don't believe that any government has the authority to tell me what I must do for my own safety. It's the same reason that as soon as the seatbelt requirement became a primary offense in Alabama, where I'm originally from, I stopped wearing my seatbelt. Now I live in the supposed free state, the live free or die state of New Hampshire. Hopefully one day it actually is free, but for now they have no requirement that I must wear the belt that then straps me into the car if the car ever turns into a flaming fireball. Although, if you want to wear the seatbelt for your own safety and you decide that that's what you want to do, then that's fine. I'm not going to you know, tell you that you're wrong. But there also should not be laws telling me that you know, making a decision about myself is wrong. And I've asked the question numerous times to several people about when do you stop? If the government can tell you what you must do for your own safety inside of your car, then how long will it be before they tell you what you must do for your own safety inside of your house? There's a statistic, and I haven't checked to update this statistic in about 10 years, but on average, 85 people per year die from falling off of their toilet. <laughs> so how long will it be before we have to install seatbelts on the toilet. <laughs> and I'm sure that there are some people that watch South Park in here. If you watch South Park, the, the Toilet Safety Administration, <laughs> I, I'm still convinced that they got the idea from me somehow. I've never met Trey Parker or Matt Stone, but I'm sure they got that idea from me. So the seatbelts on the toilet, People bump their heads on corners all the time and get concussions. So we can no longer have sharp corners on walls inside of houses. All corners must be rounded. Would people actually stand for this? If the government actually came in and said, this is what you must do in your house. And I heard somebody in the back say yes, and I have to agree with you. <laughs> because there's this horrible thing called code enforcement that tells you what your house must look like, how the house must be built. If you decide, you know what, I think that 18 inches apart on the studs is too far. I want them to be 12 inches apart. Your house does not meet code because they go through with the stud detector and the ruler and if they're not 18 inches apart, you fell in inspection. It doesn't matter that you're going above and beyond what they want. You're not doing it to their specifications, therefore you fell. In the summer of 2012, the first year that I was living in New Hampshire, I was staying in the Keene Activist Center, and a fire captain and the city code enforcer came into the house, walked into my bedroom while I was asleep, possibly naked, but that's neither here nor there, walked into my room, woke me up two hours after I had fallen asleep because I worked a late second shift, and they were doing a fire inspection. I wake up, throw some clothes on, walk out, and ask for an apology, a simple apology. Hey, you guys woke me up. What's going on? Can you say I'm sorry? Like, apologize for waking me up. No apology. 
I filed a small claims lawsuit requesting an apology and $20. The lawsuit was thrown out after a hearing, of course, you know, because they, they want to give the illusion of justice. So they had a hearing. The city claimed multiple immunities. I filed a rebuttal that all of your immunities are appealing to your own authority that I don't recognize, but it was still thrown out. The judge, to my surprise, did not cite any of their immunities. I guess because she figured that I would file an appeal, but she threw it out claiming that my rights had not been violated. So apparently, the fire chief and a code enforcer can come into your house on an illegal warrant. The warrant was illegal about a year later. Can come into your house on an illegal warrant, wake you up from your slumber, and there's no repercussions. No need to apologize. And this happens in the so-called land of the free. And again, going back to the original thought here is that if you look through history, and you don't need to read Rothbard or any of the other philosophers, although if you ever get the chance to read The Law by Frederick Bastiat, or Bastier, and however you pronounce it in French, I highly recommend that you do read it, because it's as timely now as it was when it was written in 1850, or 1848. But if you just look at history, and look at all of the tyrannies that have been committed by government in the name of keeping you safe, you will see that as long as governments exist, they will continue down the slippery slope. And some people call it the slippery slope fallacy, but it's not a fallacy because it's real. It's what they do. And it, there's a saying that if you give them an inch, they take a mile, and that's what government does. So I don't know how exactly we get to a place without government infringing on our rights, but I do know that that's the only way that we will ever actually truly be free, is to live in a society without coercive.